Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie. And man, oh man, today we have an extremely special guest, and that is Mr. Kyle Bass. Kyle, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Trey. I'm so excited to have you on. I've been following you ever since the Michael Lewis book and reading about the big short and that early success you had with Heyman Capital. And I am really curious to start out here and learn a little bit more about how you develop this passion for investing on these macroeconomic themes and theories. Where did this, how did you find that that was your niche or that was going to be sort of your approach to uh, investing? Yeah, it was, um, it was actually more of a logical process. Um, you know, when I launched the firm in 2006, we were actually uh, very interested in long Asian equities um, and was looking, if you remember back then, you know, that's when uh, housing prices had moved parabolically in the US. That's when they were getting to be roughly, you know, seven times annual income. And they'd always, they'd always hung around four and a half times. And, um, you know, so we were looking at the housing market, knowing it was a bubble, trying to figure out how to um, basically asymmetrically be short housing. You know, you, you, you didn't want to be necessarily short a home builder because a lot of them were being acquired. A lot of their mortgage origination businesses were being acquired and there was a lot of risk there. And so in, in doing the work, trying to figure out how to, how to really cap our downside, um, and we got short some, you know, mortgage bonds instead of uh, mortgage originators. And, um, you know, that was that was just kind of a, a moment that came through, you know, due diligence and research and, and searching for something uh, to get short and then uh, to hedge, you know, being long Asia. Uh, and I think it's, um, you know, when you think back to the crisis, we what what central banks did and governments did is they took the bad private assets onto the public balance sheets. Right. They started guaranteeing banks. They started investing in equity. They started taking on the risk of the bad assets in the market. So something that started as micro ended up being macro, right? This, the sovereigns were taking the bad private assets on the public balance sheets. And that happened here. It happened in Europe. We studied Europe. Uh, we studied Europe's banking system and the size of the, call it 20 biggest banks in Europe. And so the world moved, for, in my opinion, or at least in my mind, from micro investing to macro investing and now macro really drives uh sentiment and investing kind of market wide i realize there are idiosyncrasies of companies like google and facebook and the others but the excess liquidity in the markets is what drives things if all of a sudden the fed were to really aggressively taper today um i don't care what who what company you are what stock you are you're probably not going to go up for a while uh so it just, it just kind of took me into a place where um, things were more, I think for me, more logical. It was just uh, my own view. No, I was recently, I recently heard uh, Stan Druckenmiller talking about how the common theme with these very successful investors is that they always seem to have sort of this uh, concentrated position early on that they were this high conviction bet, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, as I understand it, your fund Heyman was relatively new. I think it had around 33 million in assets under management, if I'm not mistaken. That's and right. So I'm curious, at what point, how high was your conviction? What, did you put, did you go all in on this bet with that fund, the no. first fund of yours, or was it a small? No. You know, I think, look, our big year uh, was 2007. Primarily, we were short mortgage bonds at par, uh, and our negative carry was, you know, one and a half, two percent. So um, my, my downside scenario was when you think about all in, you know, my downside scenario was I lost 2% a year in the position. Uh, my upside scenario is we made 80, 90, 100%. So that was, uh, it's hard to say that we went all in, but we, but we, we had a meaningful position um, there. And then when we, we also launched our mortgage funds and our mortgage funds back then at the end of 06 is when we launched. Um, I designed it so that it had about 10 times implicit leverage and our negative carry was about 11% a year, right? So think about uh, the proposition to investors was I'm going to lose about a third of your money over a three-year period, or we're going to make 10 times your money. It was a, it was a pretty good value proposition. Um, so you could say that was all in, right? Uh, but 
you, you know, we ended up making about six X and it was, it was a great transaction. Well, that 2008 period, I mean, that's when the fed really broke the seal, so to speak of, uh, all of this currency, uh, printing that they've been going, they've been doing as of late. And as I read recently, the fed is effectively buying something like $6 billion of mortgages today. Right. And so is anything they're doing today give you any kind of deja vu from that time in 2008? No. So it's, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't believe we're in a bubble today um, as far as ratios are concerned and leverage in the system is concerned. We're in a bubble today that I don't think will pop because uh, the Fed, so regardless of how many mortgages they're buying, I think it's closer to 40 billion um, uh, right now a month. Uh, but I think it's important to note that we have 40% more cash or broad money in our system than we had two years ago or 18 months ago when the, when the uh, virus first emanated from Wuhan. Um, and so that's never happened in the history of the United States before um, to have 40% more money in the system. So I'm a monetarist at heart. And so I believe, you know, if you increase the money supply 40%, you're going to have a 40% depreciation in purchasing power, roughly thereabouts. And so uh, you and I both know inflation is running, call it uh, mid-teens, if not higher, and uh, interest rates are still at zero. So um, the insidious, you know, negative real rates of return are hitting our savings in a major way. And um, that's what's going on, right? So when you think about mortgages and housing availability, who knew that when, when, the, when the virus plagued the world, that the first thing that would happen is people would just go, you know, when rates went to, went to zero and mortgage rates collapsed even further, that everybody just bought every house they could find. Um, I wouldn't have bet that actually, but um, that's what happened. And so now we're in a scenario where the price of everything has gone up, including residential housing, including commercial real estate. And uh, I don't, while it's much higher than it once was, I don't believe we're in a bubble because uh, of the amount of liquidity in the system. So that kind of raises the question for me around real estate. How much longer do you think this will run as is before you consider it to be a bubble? Hmm. I mean... I will agree that I think, you know, the, the amount of appreciation of real estate in the last two years is, is uh, n it's unprecedented. It's never, never moved this, this fast, uh, this, this, um, this far, this fast. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, for, for it to be a bubble, it's going to have to get to many multiples of people's incomes. And you're starting to see incomes move. Um, you know, we have more job openings uh, today than we have uh, jobless people which is a really strange phenomenon as well. Um, so we're seeing, you know, uh, the price levels of wages move. So I, I you know, that I don't, the, my answer to you is, I think assets, including real estate, are gonna continue to move much higher over the next decade because I think the central banks can't raise rates uh, more than a hundred basis points. We, we're not gonna move the front end very much and it's gonna flatten the curve when they do. Uh, so I think when we start, if we start aggressively raising rates in 22, uh, I think you're going to see the curve flatten and maybe even invert almost immediately. And that's a real difficult scenario for the central banks. You know, I've heard this opinion to some degree before about this, this expectation that the Fed can't raise rates upwards of, say, 2%. What is that based on exactly? I know that the interest on our debt, right, at some point becomes untenable. So, I mean, is that the theory and is there a certain number that is that you're basing that on? Well, it's not only that, it's the expectations of the participants. So when you look at corporate America, you look at um, um, individuals in America, everyone has reset their expectations to borrowing around these low rates. And you have to think about the rate moves as a percentage of the base and not as an absolute. So if rates drop from uh, 8% to 5%, and then we raise them five to six or six to seven, you know, you're moving two off of five, right? Or are you moving down three off of eight? When you're moving from five to zero, and then you try to go from zero to one, the, the, the rate increase is almost infinitesimal, right? Uh, meaning as a percentage of, of the base. And so that's what's more functionally relevant than the nominal change in rates. And so that's number one. Number two, um, 
everyone is, including the sovereign, including the US central government balance sheet, uh, if we move, move short rates, almost everything's financed on the front end or the short end. And so if we raise rates from zero to one and then one to two, all of a sudden interest on our national debt starts costing us more than 10% uh, of GDP and things start collapsing. I mean, the, the government can't afford that, right? So this is not like the period of time in which you know Paul Volcker can ride in on a white horse and raise rates to snuff out inflation. Think about this, we won World War II. Um, we deficit spent going into World War II. So our national debt in 1946 was about 106% of GDP. And we won, we eliminated the productive capacity of about two continents. And we helped rebuild uh, you know, with the Marshall Plan, Japan and, and part of continental Europe. And we ran a trade surplus with every single trading partner in 1946. So we were able to pay off our debt from 106% of GDP down to the low 30s by the mid 1970s. So when we had the embargo and oil price spike of 79 and then runaway inflation in, in 1980, where Volcker showed up, um, we could afford to briefly raise rates um, you know, to 18%. It's, uh, it's important to think about where we were in the late 1970s, when you look at our sovereign balance sheet and corporate balance sheets and where we are today, again, Volcker cannot ride in today and fix this. You can't arrest inflation with by raising short rates. You'll bankrupt the nation. You'll bankrupt corporate America. You'll bankrupt everything. Uh, so I'm of the opinion that a move from zero to 1% is about all we can do on the short end. You mentioned inflation earlier and i've heard you use a term that honestly i hadn't come across before which was chain weighted inflation talk mm. to us about the difference between chain weighted and non-chain weighted inflation metrics and what that means for investors and their discount rates it mean it means the government rigs inflation so let me give you a perfect example so 30 years ago the average price of an average car in america was about thirteen thousand dollars a car okay uh, today, that number is just over 40,000. So it's up over 300% in 30 years. So when you think about the construct of the consumer price index or the CPI, there is an auto component to that construct. I'm just picking one out just because it's easy for us to remember how much cars used to cost and how much they cost now. Um, and of that 300 and so percent increase, what percentage of that do you think has made it into the CPI? So of a plus 300 number, what do you think has been calculated into the CPI over that time frame from August? An annually? Uh, no, in total. Total. Oh. So uh, I'm saying as a, as a, as a, as a, you know, just what percentage of the 300 made it in? A hundred percent. Yeah. Five and a half. <laughs> okay. So, so here's what chain weighting means. They say, Trey, we realized that your bank account just went down by $41,000 because you wrote a check for a new car. But, you know, we, the government, well, we must compare apples to apples. So in your new car, um, you have a digital speedometer. In your old car, it was an analog speedometer that was just driven by, um, you know, um, uh, more mechanical means. So if you were to replace your digital speedometer with that analog speedometer from 1990, um, then, it, then, your, then your speedometer wouldn't cost $900, it would only cost $70. And so they chain weight every part of the car. You have electric windows, well maybe in 1990 you had the roll up windows. So you have to subtract the cost of electric windows. You have to subtract the cost of your GPS navigator. You have to subtract the cost of everything to try to compare an apple to an apple, when in reality, your bank account still went down $40,000 and you wrote the check. But you have to realize that, that so many things are tied to the CPI, uh, especially like government uh, pension payments and right there are, there are cost of living adjustments tied to that number. So when you look at, let's say Germany, for example, they don't chain weight their inflation data. So Germany just printed year-over-year uh, -year numbers of 11.7% inflation. Sounds about right to me. Um, so it's, 
It's so fascinating when you peel back the layers of the onion to try to understand what the incentives are behind the people putting these numbers together and then what real life is. Real life is your bank account. Real life is what things actually cost you, not what they used to cost 30 years ago because you had analog this and roll up that. It's what can you buy today? And how much does your bank account decline? So they're kind of playing fantasy football with the numbers, right? They're not giving you real numbers. You see that often in real estate as well, where you might see your home appreciate and you think, hey, we should sell this maybe. But then you look, look around and say, well, I just moved into the same house basically at the same price. It'd just be a lot of friction, right? Exactly. You'd have to pay 6% and this and that. And you'd have to, you'd be behind if you flipped a house. Unless you're going to move geographic locations where you can find some sort of arbitrage, right? But right. Uh, it's really important to think about, you know, um, they always talk about also CPIX food and energy. So they're like, wait a minute. If you don't drive or eat, you know, your bank account would have been okay, right? Like, it's so ridiculous. You don't use any energy. <laughs> right? It's just, it's just crazy. So um, I try to look at things in, in real terms and, and in how they affect the population and, and what your wallet's really feeling when you go fill your car up and what your wallet's feeling when you take your wife out to dinner um, and you get the bill and think it's in pesos, but it's in dollars. You know, it's, it is, it's insane what's been happening. How well, I'm trying to understand, how is the Fed getting away with this, for lack of a better way to frame it? I mean, it seems so obvious when you have other resources to look into and, and compare to. Yeah. So how are they getting away with this? Why is it not more? I, you know, uh, I, I think it's, it is, it, the alternative was to have a much deeper recession in 2008, 2009, to have a calamitous recession in 2020 uh, on the outset of the virus. Uh, and those recessions, with those recessions would come um, more difficult hardships, maybe more um, physical violence, i.e. Uh, societal friction um, that would be difficult to, to get under control. And so what they choose here is a smoothing and the smoothing is just printing the money. Um, and the unintended consequences of the money printing are the rich get richer, because they own the assets and they have leverage on those assets. Um, the middle class, their ability to, to trade up, do better uh, and uh, is, is taken away from them, right? So the, the negative real rates of return really hit the middle class and the poor, they hit the poor the worst. So I think the very people that they're trying to protect are the people they end up hurting the most, but, it, but it's insidious, right? Because uh, it's hard for you and I to say, well, even though you and I have a retirement savings, um, we know it's going to buy less stuff than it would have bought two years ago, but we don't know how much less. And they're not actually telling us how much less. You and I just kind of have to figure out what the new cost of living is going to be in the new paradigm. So um, I, again, I say it's insidious because it's not black and white and it's very difficult for people to measure. It brings up the question, we, we do cover Bitcoin quite a bit on our show and, and it's coming to mind here because is... I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts on Bitcoin because it, the question for me starts to become around what is the real discount rate we should be using, right? With that 12% number for inflation considered, where is the real return and, and, and what discount rate and how should we include that in our discount rates? Because obviously, as soon as you factor that in, the market is, I mean, down 80% from where it is here, right? So. What, what are your thoughts on something like a Bitcoin and, and its value it could bring to the market in this kind of environment, not having Paul Volcker around? Yeah. You know, I know, I know millennials love um, private crypto and I know you're probably a millennial, um, <laughs> but I, I know that people like to think it's a, it's a, a, it's a perfect substitute or a great substitute for gold and or an inflation protector. Um, I, I tend to think that you're going to see kind of authoritarian governments and Western democracies alike start to really clamp down on Bitcoin. I know China has first kicked the miners out and then banned private crypto. They did that a year earlier than I expected them to do it. I think next year you're going to see intense regulation come from the US Treasury and, and the IRS. Um, and so uh, when I think about how to think about discount rates. And, and I think where you're going with that question is kind of how do I protect myself from this insidious 
inflation. I think there are much better inflation hedges. I know Bitcoin's done well. I know that the returns have literally been um, off the charts for many, and there are many newly minted billionaires out there in, in Bitcoin land. And I think that uh, I think the easy money's been made is is uh, what I'm telling you. And I think from here on out, um, it's going to be really difficult to make money there. So um, what I look to is are things like uh, real assets, like like even rural land. Rural land, uh, you can do a lot of interesting things with. You can actually put a, a judicious amount of leverage on it, call it 50% leverage, um, and stay way ahead of this kind of insidious um, degradation of your savings. And so I actually launched a private equity firm a couple of months ago to engage in not only acquisition of rural land, because that's where I want my money, uh, my family's money, uh, but it's also to engage in mitigating environmental impacts from big industrial and commercial users of land. So I'm kind of, um, I'm actually a, um, a tree hugger at heart. I love the environment. I love the outdoors. And, um, you know, that's where I think the best place to go is to mitigate this. And I know that's not where you wanted me to go on, on Bitcoin, but it's, it's, it's how I feel now. I own I own a couple of private positions in, in big firms that are um, trading, lending against and developing um, Bitcoins and NFTs and all of the digital universe of alphabet soup things that, that are out there. Um, so I think that I think that the blockchain, I think that NFTs, those things are all very much here to stay. Um, private crypto, I'd put a question mark by over the long run. And so I'd be careful with that now. When you say rural land, are you, is that different from something like farmland? Because I recently heard or saw a headline about Bill Gates, for example, owning like a hundred million plus dollars of farmland and same, making it same, big, kind of same, same thing. thing. Right? What I'm talking about is, is when I think about the macro movements of the population today in the United States, you have, um, you have high cost, high tax jurisdictions like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and then you have the entire West Coast of California those people are all moving to places like Texas, like Tennessee, like Florida, uh, because they're pro-business, they're low to no tax uh, uh, at the state level. Um, and you know, I know rich people can move to Aspen and Utah and everywhere that super rich people are moving, but you can't move entire Fortune 500 companies to places like, like those enclaves. So when you think about where the pro-business environment is, who's going to win over the next decade, 10 to 15 years, um, it's going to be places like Texas, Tennessee, and Florida. And with that nonlinear population growth um, comes big movements in land within, call it two, two and a half hours of major MSAs, like wh whatever you do on the weekend uh, where you live there, you probably have a second home or your parents did or your friends do. And that's what you do. You go to a lake or you go to a ranch, you go to a farm. Um, I believe you're going to see those prices move faster than uh, especially in front of those population demographic moves. Um, I think those are going to move faster than, um, than inflation will. Interesting that, you know, inflation being where it is, I didn't hear you say something like gold, right? You went to farmland. So talk to us, what's your position or your opinion on gold and has it changed at all over the years? Yeah, you know, when when private crypto came about, I mean, what what's private crypto's market capitalization today? It's north is it north of two trillion. That sounds right. So so you know, if you think back to two thousand nine, the amount of gold ever mined in the two thousand nine was seven trillion, um, and a lot of that had been you know, um, let's just say stored, lost in dowries, this and that. Um, so. When you think about that marketplace and how much money has basically never made it into that marketplace and gone into things like private crypto. And I think these people that are, that are selling some private crypto to buy real assets, they're actually not buying gold. They are going to buy more real estate, more land. And when I think about gold versus rural land, again, I have the population demographic in my tailwind. Uh, and I also have um, something that I can drive to, I can fish there. Uh, I'm not a hunter, but if you wanted to hunt, you can hunt there. You can take your kids swimming, hiking outdoors. You can't do that on a piece of gold. Uh, and so I think about the tangible benefits uh, and the, 
the both physical and and uh, mental benefits of being outside and i just i think that's uh i think that's likely to move a lot faster than gold does so i i'd much rather own that kind of land interesting you you did talk about china's ban on on crypto and we're going to talk a lot about china and different aspects of it the first point related to crypto here is the idea of China developing their own digital Central currency. Yeah, yeah, their own digital currency. What is the incentive for them to do that besides, you know, giving it yet another surveillance tool? <laughs> but well, how would that change their position in the world, at least in their minds? Yeah, I mean, that would radically change China's uh, geopolitical, uh, call it belligerence. And when you think about um, how, how offensive they've been in the last few years, first of all, in their, in their, complete botched um, review and and uh, allowance of scientists into their the into Wuhan to figure out where patient zero is and where this thing came from. You know, they're not a responsible global actor. They're they are a completely irresponsible global actor. They have a grand strategy. They're executing it. They're executing it well. And we are now trying to understand uh, in, in the much larger picture what it means for them to have a CBDC of their own, a central bank digital currency of their own. And again, it's, it's antithetical to even private crypto. Private crypto is decentralized. The idea is, you know, call it uh, not being under the purview of, call it watchful eyes of, of centralized governments. And I, I, I understand all of the kind of libertarian ideals of private crypto. But when you think about central bank digital currency, it's the opposite. Right? It's run by the government, for the government, in a centralized manner. They know exactly who, who has it. They know your spending proclivities. They would know Trey Lockerbie's social security number and where you like to spend it, how you spend it, how much you have. It would enable them, not only are you adopting the Chinese tech stack, you're not just putting some digital currency in your wallet, you're adopting the entire Chinese digital tech stack and you're giving them the ability to, to export their digital authoritarianism to you, you're allowed, the Chinese government could bribe you directly without being under the watchful eye of regulators or law enforcement. Imagine if the, if the Chinese government has the ability to bribe, cajole, coerce anyone anywhere in the world if you're holding onto their money. Like imagine that world. That world would be a much worse place to live in. And so, I believe the rollout of their CBDC next year uh, is the biggest risk to the rules-based order in the West that we've faced in the last several decades. And what would the incentive be for people to opt into a digital currency with China? Is it just that our US dollar is inflating away? No, no. Um, I think it, what people may, maybe don't realize, and maybe some do, uh, is China can make two moves. On, on, the, on the chessboard, uh, on, the, on the launch. They can say, anyone that, that imports and exports, i.e. engages in trade with us, uh, China Inc., um, you have to settle on our currency. And if you don't like it, that's okay. Um, find somewhere else to trade. So they literally could force you into their digital currency. And then they could say, oh, by the way, anyone that invests in China or has investments here, from now on, it all has to settle on CBDC. And you say, no, I kind of like the dollar. I like my dollars being invested there. And they say, sorry, you know, it's illegal. You have to buy our currency with your dollars. So what that would do is that would bring in trillions, uh, literally trillions of dollars into their coffers at the central bank. And then they would not only have more dollars to exercise their um, global, you know, belligerence with economically and militaristically, but then they would also have a stranglehold over you because if you came out and you were, let's say you transacted a lot with China and uh, let's say they screwed you on a transaction and they were supposed to pay you a million dollars worth of their CBDC and they only paid you 800,000. And you said, no, 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 our deal was a million. They would say, sorry, tough. And then you go and make a public comment on Twitter and say, they just screwed me out of $200,000. And then they turn the rest of your central bank digital currency off because you said something negative about the regime. Just think about that world. I don't think people have thought that all the way through. And I know um, the National Security Council, our intelligence agencies, DOD, we as a country have thought about this deeply. I don't think the press has written about it much at all. And I don't think there's been a lot of, of, a, of a proper dialectic here. And hopefully, hopefully, 
we will have um, a meaningful dialectic about this rollout sometime very soon. Um, I believe it should be banned, outlawed, and illegal uh, for any U.S. corporation or individual to hold. We have to. It sound that sounds hyperbolic, but you either have cancer or you don't have cancer. Uh, is how I view this. What do you think happens to oil and how it settles? You know, they've tried really hard to get people like MBZ and MBS to settle in RMB and the, the, the Middle Easterners don't trust the Chinese. And so that, that's been a, it's been a tough, uh, again, road to hoe, uh, a road to hoe. But I think with the, out, with the outset of a, of a Chinese CBDC that becomes fungible and tradable and transactable and also you know, is fr potentially freely tradable in and out of, of dollars, it gives them so much more um, uh, to stand on today. Let, let's just let me give you a hypothetical. If they attack Taiwan today, bombers, um, you know, uh, uh, fighter jets, and then amphibious assault, we have an economic nuclear button today. Their entire world depends upon dollar settlement. If we sanction the Chinese banks, the joint stock banks, and the SOE banks. We take China off the SWIFT system and their economy collapses overnight. Right? We have that button today. We don't have to send sailors into the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait and risk our brave men and women's lives. Um, what we simply press a button. If their rollout of their CBDC is successful, um, that changes the calculus of their entire geopolitical risk game. If you follow me, if we lose that button, uh, then imagine how belligerent China can be if they're not relying on us. Mm. So I think, again, that calculus is something that we all need to be thinking about. You brought up Taiwan. I'd, I'd like to touch on that because there's that speculation there, uh, and probably with a good reason, that there's a potential takeover of Taiwan, maybe sometime even after the 2022 Olympics. Mm. How should investors... Think about that. Position themselves for it. If 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 you that's know, a concern, you know, and a risk, how do we factor it into our investment approach? You know, they're not thinking about it. The, there's a Taiwan ETF that's at an all-time high today. Um, uh, it's either people don't believe it, they don't believe China will do it. If they listen carefully to Xi Jinping's October 9th speech, he he basically raised the bar on Taiwan. He said that he's trying to achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese race, quote unquote, um, and he is intent on achieving the quote Chinese dream, okay? Those are two really important phrases because what he is saying is, and he says that, that the peaceful reunification of Taiwan is a foregone conclusion. It's inevitable. In fact, they said it, they reiterated it again with their foreign ministry spokesperson yesterday, Wang Yi said that yesterday, but back to October 9th. So today is just, uh, November 4th. So call it back a little bit less than a month ago. What she said in that speech was, if you don't surrender peacefully, we're going to take you forcefully. Um, and his success as premier and emperor for life uh, is contingent upon that reunification. And if he doesn't achieve the Chinese dream or the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people, then he has failed and he'll no longer run China. That's literally what he said, October 9th, if you read carefully what he said. So he's raised that, he's, he's banging the war drums a little harder. Um, I don't know if you've seen just today, Trey, but for the first time in Chinese media, what I'm seeing all over China is they're talking about how they're fortifying uh, positions uh, in the region in which they're going to attack Taiwan from. And there are propaganda videos showing missile silos getting carried down the, the streets of China uh, that are all camoed up and uh, trains with tanks on them headed to the region, airplanes, uh, military planes landing there. And they're pushing these videos all over China for the people of China to prepare for battle. Okay, I haven't seen that. Uh, that level of rhetoric in China to date, but it seems to me like things are speeding up at a at a quantum speed, right? At, a, at a, an incredible pace. 
So whether they wait for the Olympics or not, um, I can tell you that, that the conversations that President Biden has had with Xi surround Taiwan. Uh, and we have a big national security problem with Taiwan, right? Taiwan Semi is very, very, very important to, to the US, to the US military, to our well-being, and it's literally 100 miles from the Chinese border. Um, and so the problem is uh, it normally takes about five years to build a wafer fab. We're about a year and a half into the Taiwan Semi fabs being built in uh, Arizona. And let's say it takes three or four years instead of five, we still have a duration mismatch if they move now, right? And, and if you're thinking about their calculus, uh, moving sooner rather than later is in their best interest. However, they haven't rolled out their CBDC yet. So again, this my calculus and who am I? I'm some financial guy uh, in Dallas. Uh, but if, if I were to decide, if I were to bet when something's likely to happen, I would bet the second half of next year or sooner. You brought up Taiwan Semiconductor and... I'm curious about that one, especially because if you're someone who's like me and bullish on semiconductors long term, and it's a, a seemingly great company in the space, it's a $600 billion market cap, you know, does a Chinese takeover of Taiwan affect that company or at least the prospect of it as a good business? Or does it change your outlook on the business at all? Well, it changes my opinion of Taiwan Semi's business overnight. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, if, if it's under the centralized control of the Chinese Communist Party, then you have an entire myriad of new problems to think about. And immediately, if the Chinese are running Taiwan Semi, our government, and they, and they take it forcefully, they take Taiwan forcefully, our government's likely to ban um, all products from China. So we're going to have to alternatively source. We're going to have to go to a, a different supplier uh, and, you know, we as a country realized what kind of position we were in and, and that we had let the frog boil uh, without our knowledge. Um, and, and that was it was actually under the under the Trump administration the last two years. Um, the Security Council tasked um, a former naval, naval intelligence director to help usher in and get these deals done for Taiwan Semi to build these. Imagine spending $17 billion on one building tray. Imagine what that building is gonna look like. Um, and, and that those are being built today, right? Um, we have Samsung about to break ground in, in uh, Taylor, Texas. We have Taiwan Semi building its first and I think its second wafer fabs in Arizona, broken ground. But again, those, those periods of time and the capital it takes to build those are enormous. Speaking of buildings, I'm curious about the real estate in China. Um, you have this theory around Xi's intent. I've heard you say, uh, you know, especially around Evergrande. I've, yeah. uh, I'm, I've heard you express that uh, he's intentionally detonating the real estate market. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that uh, an unintended consequence of central bank largesse has been asset prices have gotten out of hand. And in, in China, uh, when we talk about how, how housing is priced here at call it five to seven times our annual income, four and a half to seven times our annual income, in China in tier one cities, um, housing is now like 30 times average annual income. It's at a level that's so high that when you look at the birth rate of the average Chinese woman, it's 1.2 children per woman. To just sustain a population, that number has to be 2.1. It's 1.2. So you're having, a, you're having a major population decline starting in China. And the reason being is the Chinese men uh, can't afford, once they get a, uh, to be at adult age, they can't afford to have a job and buy a house. So they're living with their parents in their basement. And none of the men want to marry a woman because the woman won't marry them and live in the China in the parents' basement there. So they're not getting married. They're not procreating. They're not having children. And she realized that this is a structural nightmare for him as a central planner. So they eliminated the one child policy and said, how about three? Well, guess what? It didn't work. People aren't having three because they can't afford to have three. And real estate is a third of China's economy. In the US, it's about 18% of our economy. So the real estate prices are so high and so out of reach. And the average Chinese person owns 
you know, apartments. That's it's where they've just been plowing their money in a speculative fervor. And so now what she's doing is introducing property taxes, which heretofore didn't exist. So imagine if you didn't have a negative carry, well, you could go speculate in real estate. Imagine if you had to pay 2% a year, um, you wouldn't speculate that much in real estate, right? Um, so he's, he, in a speech just a few days ago, he talked about further moving property taxes higher in the midst of a real estate crunch. This is, he is going to bring down real estate prices and they're gonna stay down. That is his, that is the common prosperity of the people. That's his goal. And companies like, you know, there are eight developers now in default. Um, Evergrande is, is all these bonds are going to get wiped out. That's the bottom line. Um, and Westerners are going to do a lot poorer than, than domestic Chinese. They'll give domestic Chinese a few pennies on the dollar and they'll tell Westerners, sorry, thanks for playing. Um, so if you've noticed the Chinese high yield bond market, you know, had its worst two months ever in the last two months. Uh, it's basically dropped from par to, to way below 70 in the, in the entire high yield marketplace. It's probably going a lot lower. Um, so you've got a scenario where you're going to see real estate come down and stay down because it's driven by Xi Jinping. It's not just going to bounce back and everything's going back to puppies and rainbows uh, at some point in time. He realized that he made a major mistake letting the central bank print as much uh, Chinese money as they did and allow the rampant speculation that he allowed. So this crackdown is not because Jack Ma is super rich. It's not because the property developers are too flashy with their jets and cars and things like that. That might have something to do with it, but it's really core to the central planning of the Chinese Communist Party. I have a couple points there. Um... Does that have any systemic risk, right? You know, there was a speculation that Evergrande was the next Lehman there for a minute. It doesn't sound like you share that opinion, but is there, you know, these bonds getting wiped out, does that have a rippling effect across the globe? I don't think so. And, and uh, it, well, let me rephrase that. I believe that if you've seen Goldman Sachs' most recent report and expectations for Chinese GDP, they've taken it to zero. That's, pretty, that's a pretty big statement, right? But if a third of your economy is going to go pretty significantly negative, and the other two thirds of your economy are, you know, slightly positive. You could get to a zero number. Um, God forbid, China only grows at zero, right? Um, but I think if China does it has a zero percent growth in GDP for a year or two, that just means global GDP won't grow anywhere near where anyone's expecting. So the global slow down a bit. Um, when you think about the systemic nature of what's going on, you know, um, we all know Evergrande has about three hundred billion of debt. 200 billion, call it uh, internal Chinese debt and 100 billion external, maybe dollar bonds. Um, you know, those bonds are not levered 10 to one in foreign financial institutions. Um, Lehman was interconnected to both the US banks and the European banks with massive derivatives risk. Um, no one signed ISDA agreements with Chinese banks because Chinese banks demanded uh, to have the jurisdiction be Beijing law. And of course, there's no such thing as Beijing law. So none of the either domestic West, uh, US or European banks have, have major counterparty risk there. So th the question becomes internal. So are the, are the Chinese banks gonna get wiped out? For sure they will, right? I mean, uh, they'll, have in, they'll have huge holes in their balance sheets, but with the Chinese government back depositors, without a doubt. So I think that tree is going to fall in the woods. I don't think many are going to hear it. I think there'll be some people that are super wealthy over there that, that end up losing everything. But I don't, I don't think a default crisis will go global here. I think that they will, they will take real estate down, hold it down. The Chinese property developers are all going to be massacred because there will be no bounds and they're all hyper levered to price. Um, and then the banks are all going to have huge holes in their balance sheets and their banking systems three and a half times their GDP. They will print enough uh, RMB internally to kind of uh, save the Chinese people from, you know, jumping off a cliff. Uh, but I don't see global contagion into uh, Western banks. Got it. You mentioned Jack Ma a little bit ago and, you know, Alibaba is down around 50 percent or so from where it was a year ago. So your typical, you know, your typical value investor might take a look at that and say, hmm, that looks interesting. Uh, not, I mean, I can gauge that you're probably not investing in too many Chinese stocks, but I'm curious, 
does something like Alibaba at its current price level uh, intrigue you at all? Or is there some kind of just Chinese accounting suspicion that, that keeps you away? I mean, have you really peeled back the layers of the onion and looked at Alibaba's earnings? Alibaba's earnings come from markups of their private investment positions. And they run it through their, their income statement. Alibaba is like the biggest house of cards I've ever seen. You know, I have no idea what their real financials are and neither do you and neither does Charlie Munger for that matter. Um, you have never submitted themselves to a real Western audit. And now you have Xi Jinping risk. How, Trey, what discount rate do you put on a company that doesn't submit itself to real audits and has Xi Jinping risk? I mean, I, I, think, I think if you're a fiduciary, whether you're a fiduciary to your household, to your kids, or as a real market fiduciary, you should lose your job if you buy Chinese stocks that are unaudited, which are all of them right now. That markup aspect is interesting. Talk to us, give us one example of that accounting, uh, those accounting issues, I guess is for lack of a better word, that um, come up with something like Alibaba and how they're I mean, working into the stock. It, it, you know, you, you look at their, at their markup of, of Ant Financial in their own income statement, and it was representing like a third of their earnings for 2020. Uh, and when Ant Financial goes away or gets revalued lower, they don't run it through the, the income statement. So I, you know what? I don't know. I just, and think about how Ant Financial happened. Imagine if you and I were running Alibaba and we're like, hey, let's start this consumer finance platform. How about you and I and 15 other people, we just, we kind of split it off. How about we take 50% of the company and we let the shareholders of Alibaba have the other half? Does that sound like a good deal? Oh yeah, that sounds great. They literally stole half the company. Imagine if that happened here, you'd be behind bars in 10 seconds. But we just nod our head and say, well, I guess that's the way the Chinese do it. They just, um, because they're running the company, they get to keep half of it. Well, that's not the way it goes. And you know, people just look the other way because they have FOMO, right? They have Chinese FOMO. They can't wait to get to the end of that 1.4 billion person rainbow of riches and El Dorado and somehow leveraging the Chinese people. When in the end, the Westerners never make the money. I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about oil because I've heard the theory of yours that I found fascinating around our lack of investment in hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons and how that might actually lead to even inflation or higher inflation in food prices and, and others. What's your current take on oil and walk us through that theory a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's oil and gas, right? It's, it's seven years ago, the public markets, when we had kind of the, the fracking decline um, and that we became energy independent, you know, um, six or seven years ago when we were fracking and, and, uh, drilling at, at such a high rate when oil was $120 a barrel, call it 2014. Um, and then we had, a, we had a, an abundance of oil and we're the Saudi Arabia of natural gas uh, and we had a ton of natural gas. And so oil prices dropped to, into the low 30s and natural gas prices went below $2 an M. And then we started virtue signaling. We said, you know what? It's time. It's time to go to alternative energy we have global warming happening and climate change, and it, it's all well-intentioned, so don't get me wrong. I, I believe that global warming is here, and the numbers suggest it's here. Whether it's secular or cyclical, uh, it'll be left to um, science uh, over the decades. But um, So I'm a, I'm a big believer in saving the environment and doing what we can to be responsible stewards of both the environment and, and our lands. But you have to take a major step towards sustainable power, meaning we blew it when we stopped uh, engaging in nuclear power plant building. We could have solved this many, many, many years ago. We could have solved global warming. The same people screaming global warming and climate problems today are the same protesters that protested nuclear power uh, after Three Mile Island, after Chernobyl, and then maybe even after Fukushima, um, imagine if we just stopped flying airplanes after two of them crashed, right? Um, the technologies are so much better. It's so sustainable. It's the cleanest, most, it's the best way to power things. But what we did is we stopped spending on hydrocarbons seven years ago, right? Public market analysts said, 
you can't spend outside of your EBITDA anymore to, to the hydrocarbon industry. Um, and then you started seeing over the top, you know, virtue signaling from corporate investors and corporate boards. And you've seen, you've seen a mass exodus of funding in the capital markets for anything hydrocarbon based. It takes decades, many decades to move from one fuel source to another. It did for coal, it did for natural gas, and it's going to uh, for alternative power. But even with alternative power, we need a much better storage matrix. Right now, it's just a, it's just a great idea. Um, wind and solar are amazing, but they're not powering any kind of major percentage of the grid, and they can't be base load power. So if we stopped, if we mothball the cold plants, we won't lend to natural gas and we won't lend to, to oil. And in fact, now private equity is having trouble raising money in hydrocarbons. So now we have a scenario where demand is inelastic, right? We have, do you know how many cars there are in the world driving around, cars and trucks? There are 1.2 billion cars and trucks driving around. How many, how many electric vehicles are on the road today? A hundred million? 10 million? <laughs> no. I think it's around 30 million. 30 million. Yeah. 1.2 billion combustion engines, 30 million. It's amazing. The 30 million electric cars. When you think about it in the grand scheme of things, we still, the world still uses a hundred million barrels of oil every single day. So if we stop spending seven years ago and we're not drilling for more now, and there's the, the long rated decline curve of production is about 7%. So we lose 7% of production every year if, we, if we're not drilling. Um, and in the next 20 years, we'll have one and a half billion cars on the road uh, that are combustion engines, and we'll have 100 million electric vehicles. 100 million, amazing, out of one and a half billion combustion engines. So Demand for hydrocarbons is inelastic. It's going to keep growing and we're not spending the money to find it. So what I believe is going to happen, if we have a cold winter this winter, you're going to see numbers you've never seen before. Because and you remember when oil went below zero? Yep. In the front end, there was a problem. There was nowhere to put it. The exact opposite's about to happen. On the front end, demand might tick up from 100 million barrels a day to 105 as the world opens. And there isn't 105 of production. Oh, and by the way, for seven years, we've under CapEx production. We can't just flip a switch. So you see Biden at OPEC begging them for more production. At the same time, he's saying no more interstate pipelines, no more drilling federal lands. Like I get what he's saying. And the people that are running Biden's energy and climate team are actually good friends of mine, uh, believe that or not. Um, but you can't turn something off in kind of an absolutist fashion overnight and flip a switch and think you can change energy sources because you believe it's a good idea. It is a good idea. But the incrementalist approach over decades, it's what it's going to take. And what's going to end up happening is I'm going to predict something. You're going to see prices you've never seen before for hydrocarbons in the next six months and maybe six months to two years. And you, those prices will unseat the current leadership because you're going to see energy prices and food prices ripping because of underinvestment and because of excess capital in the system. So I think that's the grave mistake that the virtue signaling uh, is going to, um, I think uh, that's what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to see the, you're going to see these things happen. And by the way, the front end, so at the immediate delivery month of crude and natural gas, they can go anywhere. I mean, the right, whatever that marginal cost is, uh, our marginal barrel, uh, what someone's willing to pay for it, someone's going to pay it. So I'm not saying the whole curve out 30 years is going to move to 150 or 200. But what I'm saying is the front end of crude oil and the front end of natural gas, you could see numbers you're going to need a slide rule to calculate if I'm right about this. Do you have a gallon of gas prediction? In Dallas, yeah, I mean, you could you could easily see all all time highs for gallons of gas. You could see six dollar gasoline easily. Do you think that then creates more demand for the electric vehicle market and and maybe accelerates that adoption a bit more? But but Trey, how do we produce the electricity to plug the gosh damn vehicles in? 
we burn natural gas. We burn natural gas. That's, that's our alternative power source. So you can't spin enough windmills and have enough solar to power the additional electric cars. You have to put electricity into the grid. People just haven't thought this all the way through. I heard that China is making a big move into nuclear in the near term. Do you think that will give us any more confidence of doing the same? You know, um, there's like places like France that have 70% of their grid is nuclear. There are some people that had it figured out. China is currently building more coal-fired power plants today than the entire coal-fired installed base of Europe. They're building that much this year. So yeah, they want to say they're building nuclear, they're building coal, they're building whatever they can build because their entire system is so broken. Their grid is massively underserved and they're telling their bread and butter manufacturers that they can only uh, manufacture every other week now because they have, they have rolling brownouts. So it's ha they're having a real problem. Hi, buddy. Hi there. Look at this. We're having a party. Hello. Who's this? This is C. Hi, C. Hi. Can you see my friend, Trey? Hi, buddy. Right there. How are you? You look to be Wait. about my son's Wait. age. Give him a wave up here. Look, Hi. See your hand? Hi. We're in the middle of a podcast. How old is he? Four or five? Maybe, He's or? two. He's two. Oh, he's two. Wow. Okay. I was going to say he looks young, but I have a three and a half year old. So it's like, oh, there looks, you go. yeah, you look maybe a little taller, but maybe it's because you're sitting down. Okay. I'm almost done, buddy. No nose pick. <laughs> I'll be right out to play. Okay. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, the, that was the first public sighting of Z. Of Z. Okay, got yeah. it. I heard it correctly now. Z, is that short for something? Yeah, Xander. Xander, cool. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, I, I, I want to, we, did we finish your point though? I want to make sure we captured yeah, no, that. I, just, I, think it's, I think it's important just to, to, to think the longer term through hydrocarbon demand is inelastic. And it's growing at an ever, ever increasing pace. And whether China's building nuclear or coal, when you think about Chinese electric cars, the way you need to think about them is they're coal burning cars because the entire Chinese grid is powered by coal. Um, so when you're feeling good about seeing electric cars on the road, just remember that coal is what made the electricity that's in the car. So, um, you know, I, the entire idea of getting, our, getting, our, getting earth to a better place is really dependent upon only about eight countries and China's the number one country. Whatever they do with their emissions, so goes the world. Uh, and clearly they're not even engaging in emissions conversations. They're, they're telling us, oh, they'll be carbon neutral by 2050. I mean, give me a break. You know, like the, that you, could, you and I could say whatever you wanna say about 2050, it's, it's a joke. But in the meantime, they are massively increasing their carbon footprint and they're doing it with coal. Um, so, when we think about hydrocarbon pricing going forward, um, I think you're going to see prices that really shock people. And I think that's actually going to empower some regime change in, in a number of countries, potentially including China, right? The, the worst thing an authoritarian uh, uh, leader can see is skyrocketing food and energy prices because it hits the, the billion or so Chinese that are already dirt poor. Um, so uh, that's my prediction, much higher hydrocarbon prices. So circling back to what we spoke about a little bit earlier around inflation, and if we're predicting that it's 12% and, and without tapering, it seems like it's not going to be very transitory, right? So for the retail investor who can probably only expect, you know, on average, historically, 7 8% from the S&P, which in my opinion has become sort of the default savings account for the retail investor, yeah. is that the best they can do, you know, uh, if they can't afford rural land or whatever, if they're, if they're dollar cost averaging into their IRAs, 401ks, is that the best they've got? Or um, are there other ways to, you know, you know we're, I guess our conversation today uh, has been on the fact that we're entering a stagflationary period, right? We're going to see, we're going to see nominal numbers continue to move higher. We're going to see real rates of return negative because the difference between, uh, you know, nominal and real is inflation. Um, uh, and, and stocks typically keep up with about 80%, 80 to 85% of that, uh, move. So you'll feel kind of good about it, but you'll still be losing purchasing power, I think over time. So again, um, 
I started this private equity firm called Conservation Equity Management to do exactly what I would do, which I'm doing, uh, to try to stay ahead uh, of that insidious uh, negative real rates of return. So, uh, you know, if people want to talk about it, they should call me. So summing up, you know, given the fact that the Fed can't taper, what is the end game, in your opinion, to right this ship and keep U.S. dominance, uh, especially with U.S. dollar? Yeah, I think they will taper. Um, so I'm not saying they can't. What I'm saying is when they do, uh, and if they start raising short rates, you're going to see a curve flattening and it'll be, it'll be recessionary, right? Um, so it'll, it'll snuff out uh, economic growth in the, in the United States. Um, for us to maintain our global hegemonic position, um, we should outlaw the Chinese central bank digital currency. We should make it illegal. We should enforce the rules-based order within our, within our own uh, bo uh, borders. We should try to become less partisan uh, and have the centrist run things and not the progressives and the radicals uh, on, on either side. Um, the problem is uh, I'm not hopeful about that. I think we're more divisive than we've ever been. And that's largely due to the, the gap between the haves and have nots widening. Uh, and I think that continues to widen. So I think you and I, when we think about protecting what we've worked so hard to save, um, you've got to be thinking in, in ways that people that are alive today, most people that are alive today, didn't really live through, invest through the late 70s and, and early 80s. Um, you know, when you think about the core of the investment corpus today in, in America, uh, and that was a period in time in which the government could do something about it. Here, I think they're going to be walking a tightrope of raising short rates, flattening the curve, you know, trying to figure out how to stimulate again. They'll have to come back and, and inject some more capital in the markets and, and, again, grow the central bank balance sheets. Look, you've seen Japan do it, seen Europe do it. We're just behind the, if you think about it on a timeline, we're third uh, in time. But, you know, everybody's doing it, whether you're the UK uh, whether you're the Bank of England, the PBOC, the BOJ, the Fed, everyone's doing it uh, and they'll keep doing it. So I think it's important to just think about how to defend yourselves from that. Kyle Bass, this has been an incredible honor to have you on our show. I really enjoyed it. I learned a ton. And uh, I would like to, before I let you go, hand off or give you the opportunity to hand off to our listeners any other resources you want to share. <laughs> No, I don't have any other resources, but uh, I appreciate it, Trey. Thanks for your time. Fantastic. Well, I, I hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, it's a pleasure meeting you. You as well. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 